so far in our general motion, if you remember. This is where we're combining both the rotational aspect of a rigid body and the translational aspect of uh, uh, at least some point on that object. We'll, uh, we'll uh, even be a little more specific with that as we get to the uh, kinetics in a little while. We're still working on the kinematics of rigid bodies. We did the absolute motion. That works well if, uh, if at least one point on the body is following a prescribed path then you can actually prescribe that path and then uh, take the derivative of it to get the velocity and acceleration. Then we did the uh, relative motion. Actually, we did the relative velocity, which would make you perhaps tremble with fear that we're going to do relative acceleration, and that's indeed what we're going to do today. Then we did instantaneous center. Um, those well, the, the first one would allow us to do some acceleration. The second one, we didn't even approach the acceleration there. I don't know if anybody was thinking that was missing. Uh, but that's what we're going to do today as we, uh, as we finish this up. And as has been the case before, once we hit the acceleration, uh, especially with curvilinear paths, Things are a little bit more complicated just because there's some extra things going on. And that will indeed be the case today as we get uh, going here. So uh, we did have the relative velocity equation that we used uh, in great detail for uh, some of our work uh, uh, a couple days ago. I think that was uh, actually a week ago, I guess it was. And then if we take the time rate of change of that, then we get a relative, uh, relative acceleration equation, which is at first blush, not too big a deal. And whichever of these notational forms you prefer, is fine, but the general idea is just like it was with velocity. If we know something about the motion, the acceleration specifically of one of the points on the body, we know something about the relationship between the two, we can find out the actual acceleration, the uh, uh, true and absolute acceleration of the second um, uh, point or other combinations thereof. If we know the acceleration of two of the points, we can then use that to figure out the relative acceleration between the two. That will allow us to get the angular acceleration of the body. Uh, other, other viewpoints like that. So there's, there's lots of different ways. So imagine we've got some rigid body here with two points on it of interest. Remember, it's most important in these rigid bodies that we remember the distance between those never change. We could pick any two points. Um, the full definition of a rigid body involved a triangle, but it's sufficient to say any two points is possible. No change in distance between any two of them. And imagine, uh, because of whatever its general motion is, that one point is following some path and the other point is following some other path. Not necessarily uh, are these parallel, and I hope it doesn't really look like that, because remember, the, the, if these paths were parallel, the two paths were perfectly similar to each other, and these are two different points on the body, then we just have translational motion. If the paths are different in some way, and not even parallel, uh, then we do have uh, some kind of rotational component to the motion uh, to describe this. So because of this, uh, we might have some angular 
velocity that this uh, object is undergoing, and there may be some angular acceleration as well. I just happen to draw them in that direction, but they could, either one could be in either direction. There's no reason they need to be in the same direction. There's no reason they need to be in that direction. But uh, because of this, we've got perhaps uh, A accelerating in some direction that we may or may not know. But for uh, ease of argument, we usually assume we know the acceleration of A. And we're either trying to find the acceleration of B as a function of these angular components, or we know the angular, or we're, we know the acceleration of B, we're trying to find the angular components of their velocity. <coughs> so B might be accelerating in some direction of its own, known or not known, depending on what the problem is. But that acceleration itself has two components to it. It has a tangential component, acceleration of B in the tangential direction, as the possibility that uh, uh, B is actually accelerating down its own path. It also has a normal component, and we'll define that direction as the one directly towards that point A. And in fact, then we can be even a little more explicit with this. We can say this is the acceleration of B relative to A in the tangential direction. This is the acceleration of B relative to A in the normal direction. There it is. I told you this is a, this is a day of great detail. So hopefully your pictures are nice and big. Hopefully you're using color chalk to take notes so that all this is making uh, great sense. All right, so uh, as you can imagine, the, the one of, of great interest to us is really this piece here. The other ones are just absolute accelerations, uh, maybe known. Maybe we're trying to find them. It depends upon what we have as we go into the problem. But this is then made up of the two components. Um, each in its own particular direction. <coughs> so uh, I guess I can just draw it as a vector and just label it as the tangential component. And then the acceleration vector and the normal component. And we've visited those before as we did the rotational motion. I'm just rewriting what I finished where, with there at the bottom, so I'll have a little space to expand it. Farther. We have these two components of the relative acceleration. Remember, this is the motion of B as if you are sitting at A. And what it looks like B is doing to A, to the observer at A, it looks like B is orbiting them because of this uh, rotational component of the motion of the rigid body. If you were sitting at A and doing nothing but looking out at B, it looks like B is orbiting around you, and it may be doing so faster and faster in the tangential direction, but then there's also the centripetal component that we have of any kind of orbital motion of any kind. So these two pieces here, then, we've looked at uh, a little bit before, but we can expand on them a little bit now. We've got to make sure we get every part of it in the correct order. So this is the tangential component. So we can take care of it as uh, simply the uh, acceleration, if you will, of the arc length. 
in the tangential direction. What are our uh, unit vectors, our little e's? Is that right? That's what we've used in this class is these little e's. Uh, some classes use O's, some use the T itself. If we need to be more explicit with this, as we looked at uh, in previous uh, previous classes with a pure rotational motion, we just need the relative position vector to define it all. When we were looking at pure rotation, the center of rotation, A, had no acceleration, so it was just simply the, the distance from A that we need there, but we need to be a little more explicit now because we do have this component B relative to A. So that'll give us those two pieces. That'll take care of this tangential component. The normal component is a little bit different. If you remember, in one form, it's r omega squared. If we take out uh, omega and put in r over v, I'm sorry, v over r, we get the v squared over r, what is familiar with, in the normal direction. And if we do this as full cross products, it's that double cross product, omega cross, with the cross product omega cross r b relative to a. We'll be able to do this middle one that's a little bit simpler because we're working with two-dimensional problems. We can figure out uh, very quickly on most of our problems just where these things are. So if you're uh, in the mood, uh, this takes you have a third form, which is minus omega squared times a vector, uh, just meaning that r points out from a to b, and this is minus because it's a centripetal component where the acceleration <coughs> is towards the center, which uh, as far as the relative motion is concerned, the center of the rotation is uh, a itself. All right, so there's the setup. Let's, uh, let's apply it to a problem with which we're familiar. That, uh, that rack and uh, uh, gear problem that we did a little bit earlier. So we have this outer gear that runs without slipping. Uh, unless otherwise mentioned, all of our problems are subject to the no-slip consideration. And then we have this interior interior gear upon which rode this long uh, uh, rack. And again, no slip there either, so imagine either one of those geared as you wish, but there's no slippage going on between the two. Make these nice and big because uh, we have to have. Uh, sorry, Joe. Oh, that's pretty big. You, you, you can work. You can go home and redraw it. What else are you going to do this weekend? Um, if you remember, we had a lot of stuff to get on there just dealing with uh, velocity. Now we've got more to get on there now that we're going to throw in acceleration. So our original problem was that we knew the velocity of this point A. We called this point B, this point C, and this point D over here. And so we analyzed that problem uh, in terms of what the velocities of all those particular points were. But remember that the velocity of point B actually gave us the velocity of the rack itself uh, at that instant. So, uh, what other pieces did we have? This radius is uh, 150 millimeters. 
this radius was 100. And I think, yeah, we came up, we, we had a couple more things. Let's see, the velocity of A was 1.2 meters per second. So as a vector, that was, we'll take that as the I direction. We also came up with the angular velocity of the wheel itself, which was minus 8 radians per second k. That's something we had to determine when we did that problem. We used the relative motion to do so. And then we also came up with the velocity of b was uh, 2 meters per second. Also in the i direction. Uh, I think we had the velocity of d, but uh, we're not necessarily going to need it here. Okay, so that's, that's just the problem we did, I believe, on Monday, sort of rehashed with some of the results put up there. Because now we're going to add to it the possibility that point A <coughs> has some acceleration. So we'll add that on here as one of the givens. Let's say it's 3 meters per second squared in the I direction is drawn. Just uh, sort of arbitrary term, but it would be uh, it would be horizontal to the uh, lower floor because that's all point A can do. It can only go in a continued horizontal way. And so some of the things we want to find. The angular velocity of the wheel itself and uh, well, we'll go ahead and find the acceleration of points uh, B, C, and D. Okay, so there's there's our setup. All right, the angular acceleration. Uh, itself, that's a pretty easy one because remember point C has no velocity at that instant and so it's as if everything rotates around that point so we need the velocity of A relative to C and then we can just set that up as, as, we, uh, as we have before where the acceleration of a particular point is uh, R times alpha between them. We don't need anything more than that. We already know the direction of it. There's only one thing it can do. Uh, so we can just imagine that at that instant in time, point A is in uh, rotational acceleration about point C at that instant. And so we can figure out then that alpha is the, uh, the 3.0 divided by the 150 millimeters, which is uh, 20 radians per second then. Sorry, 20 radians per second squared. And we already know that uh, it's going to be uh, in the count, uh, clockwise direction, which is minus k as a vector. So, uh, nothing, nothing terrifically common. We don't need the cross product for that one. Um, you just need to remember that at the instant, sh at any instant shown, the contact point has no velocity. Point C, if it remains with the wheel, will go somewhere else in a second a split second, and we're going to find out about that when we found out its acceleration. Um, but at that instant in time, it has no velocity. Uh, it may or may not have acceleration. We'll have to find that as we go through this. Okay, 
So we can find the acceleration then of uh, point B. <coughs> we'll relate it to point A, which is nice because that's already known, that was given. using our relative acceleration equation. So we just need to find out that second part, but that second part is made up of these two components here, the tangential and the normal component. So we just need to do both of those. Uh, it's a matter of uh, uh, walking through the pieces. So we'll take the acceleration of A, add to it, the tangential component of that acceleration, relative acceleration, and the normal component of that relative acceleration. Um, doing whichever one of these different ways to do it is more comfortable to you. Most of us will uh, find a, a slight variation of this because it's just the product of the magnitudes which we've got and then we just figure out the direction by simple observation of where the uh, cross product would result. So let's see, uh, let's do these in pieces just for clarity and then we'll bring them back. So the tangential component is the cross product alpha cross r, but since it's two dimensional on all of our vectors are automatically uh, perpendicular, then all we need is the product of these. So this will be R B relative to A, which is no trouble, that's the radius of the smaller disk, times the, the magnitude of the angular acceleration, which is also no trouble because we just found it and then in whatever direction that may lay. So let's see what, that, uh, what the deal is here. Uh, alpha is in the minus k direction. Remember we figured out uh, based upon this acceleration that uh, alpha itself is like that. So that's the minus k direction. So the alpha vector straight into the wall. Cross that with the vector that goes from A to B. So we have straight in crossed with the vector that goes from A to B. So that puts our thumb in the I direction. And so we're done with the cross product. We know that this will be in the I direction. That is the tangential direction for point B relative to point A. Everybody comfortable with that? If you do the cross product itself with these two vectors put in, that should be exactly what you get. And we've got those bits. The magnitude of B relative to A is the 100 millimeters. And alpha we just found is 20 radians per second squared. Not the minus. The minus we already used when we established the direction of the alpha vector, the angular acceleration vector, and then used the cross product on it. That gave us this positive I. So we don't want to put the minus 20 in here. This is magnitude only. The minus went with the direction. And then that's I. So this is, uh, did I have it in meters per second? Yeah. yeah. So this would be then uh, two uh, meters per second squared in the I direction. So we've, uh, we've got this one because it was given. We've got this one because we just did it. And only you had to, uh, had to mentally do the cross product, didn't have to actually do it. Um, if you're relieved with that, stand up and shout. Thank you. No stand up, but that's all right. Uh, so we can now do the other part. 
let's see if we can do it this way. Uh, same vec same radial distance between the two points, and <coughs> if we know the angular velocity of the wheel, uh, which we do, so we can do this one in the same kind of way. A the, accel <coughs> the relative acceleration between the two points in the normal direction is uh, the same RBA that we already used, omega squared, and we can, th it's probably easier to do this one than it is to do two cross products, but you can check it. Uh, it's very important which order you do these cross products in because you're just the wrong direction if you don't. So uh, minus omega squared, that's no big deal. Uh, the vector RB to A is that one, RB relative to A is in that direction and we're opposite that direction, which would make sense if B is moving around A, it's got to have the centripetal component, which must be towards A, but this vector is away from A. So that line of sign makes sense. We can do, uh, so we're opposite that direction, which is plus J, so this is now minus J. Everybody follow the logic? You're frowning. Did you follow the logic? We know the direction of this vector. It just goes from A to B, which is in the plus Y direction. So we're in the minus J direction then with the vector. And all we need to do is then put in the magnitudes, which we know. So that's uh, 100 millimeters. Omega squared, the magnitude is 8, so that is squared. Uh, oh, and then uh, minus J direction. Running out of board here. Uh, that's minus 6.4J meters per second squared J. Okay, so let's put those all together. I'm going to have to keep track of some of the points as we're going here. Erase some when we don't need them. Remember, we're looking for the acceleration of B. Acceleration of point B, that's the fact that A itself is accelerating and they're tied together, so that affects each other. That's 3 meters per second I. That was just given. All of these will be meters per second squared, so I'll put the units in at the end. Plus the tangential component of the acceleration of B about A, which was 2 meters per second squared I, <coughs> flush, so I'll just add that into the I vector I already had from A. Let's see, this is the acceleration of A. This is the acceleration of B relative to A, tangential. And then I have the normal component that we just figured out, which is the minus 64J, uh, 6.4, sorry, J. And all of that is meters per second squared. So let's, uh, let's see what we got here. We'll draw a nice big picture. There's B. There's the rack that runs on point B. And point B has a 5 meters per second squared component in the I direction. 
So that's A, B, uh, in the x direction, I guess, our i direction, and minus 6.4 in the j direction, so it's about that length, plus a little bit more. So that's acceleration of point B in the y direction, and then of course, it's actually the two of those put together. So that then is the acceleration of point B at that instant. Due to the fact that the wheel's rotating and it's accelerating as it rotates. I don't know about you. I couldn't have looked at this problem, looked at point B and anticipated that. Maybe on some of the other points we could have, but uh, just not that one. Tom, you freaking out? No, you're okay. It's a bit more complicated than just it's got to have acceleration forward because of A does, and it's got to have normal down because it's yeah. yeah. Not only is point B accelerating forward, but it's also accelerating down, and you can tell that because a split second later, it's that point is going to start coming down the the rim of that inner gear because that that is marking the point B, that point B is on the gear itself, not on the rack. And so that kind of anticipates for us that it would be somewhat accelerating that downward direction. Uh, I don't think it's, it's obvious that it was greater in the y direction, minus y direction. Uh, but that has to do with, with what the angular velocity and the accelerations themselves were. And these are just made up numbers. Was everybody comfortable with doing this step as the cross product rather than actually working through the cross product? Because actually laying up the cross product I think is more work. We can do this because it's a two-dimensional problem and these vectors that we're concerned with are automatically perpendicular to each other. And a perpendicular cross product is the easiest of all of them because the magnitude is just the uh, product of the magnitudes of the other vectors going into it. And then we can just figure out by observation, doing the right hand rule, what the direction is. All right, I need board space. Can I erase that? We can go on to point C. That's point B. We'll do point C now. But we'll do it in very much the same way so we can step through it again as, a, as another exercise in doing this relative acceleration. All right, so that's, a, that's acceleration of point B. Acceleration of point C, we'll do it in the same way. Uh, it's tied to point A, and point A is accelerating. We could do this with point B instead of A, now that we know, well, we used to know the acceleration of point B. You have it written down, I know. Um, but uh, the acceleration of point A is a lot simpler since it's linear. And then the acceleration of C relative to A, and that being as it was before, both a tangential component and a normal component, both of which we figure out in the same way we just did for point B. So we'll step through that together and see if we all get the same thing. Acceleration point A we know, that's the easy part. So we'll do the acceleration of point A in the tangential direction. That's R, not B relative to A, 
let's see relative to A. We're doing a different point now. This was written down for point B. So now we're doing point C. So this is R, C relative to A, alpha in the tangential direction. So again, let's see, alpha is into the board. The direction of C relative to A is in the opposite direction than uh, what we had before. Uh, written down here, this is A relative to C. We want opposite that. So we have alpha into the board, R, C relative to A straight down. That means it's in the minus I direction. So we'll put in a minus sign, put in the I sign, and then we can put in the pieces, which gives us uh, minus 3 meters per second squared in the I direction. A lot easier to do it that way than to do the cross products, taking advantage of the fact that these are all perpendicular vectors. If they weren't, we'd do the cross product. All right, so now we have the acceleration of A and the acceleration of C relative to A in the tangential direction. Now we'll do it in the normal direction. Uh, this is probably the easier one to use. Minus omega squared. We've got omega. It's still the same angular velocity it had before. And the vector RC relative to A. Remember, this is written for B on this side. We're now doing point C. So the vector C relative to A, which goes from the center down, we're in the opposite direction of that. So that was minus j. This makes it a plus j. So we can just write a plus j. And we've got those. Omega squared times RCA, which is the, uh, which is the 150 millimeters. We do that up and get 9.6. meters per second j, positive. Now, we've got all three parts. You put it back together and tell me what the acceleration of point C is. We've got all three parts. We've now got the acceleration of A, which was given at the start of the problem anyway. Now we've got the two components of the relative acceleration. And now you can put them in, put the whole vector together. Then sketch it like we did for point C, uh, sorry, point B, and see if it makes any sense. So here's the bottom of the wheel, riding on the ground, no slip, there's point C, let's see what it looks like. acceleration of point C? Yeah. Oh, you guys, they're all such phonies. 
Notice, let's see, we have a point A that has a plus 3i acceleration. The tangential component has a minus 3i, so the i component cancels. We're left with just 9.6 meters per second squared j, which is simply a centripetal component. And everybody swears that they saw that coming. You didn't, did you? I didn't. But then you think about that, remember that point's not moving at the second, it's in pure rotation uh, relative to point A. Um, uh, uniform circular <coughs> motion at that instant about point A. All right. Two point T. There's point B and C now. Two point D. Yes, sir. It's D right there. Two point D, and then sketch it out. See what it looks like. See if it makes some sense. I guess this also makes some sense. An instant later, remember the wheel has rolled a little bit farther, and that point C will have just gone up at that second. It's also gone forward a little bit by then, but I can't draw an actual instant in motion. I have to draw uh, a macroscopic delta T. So you lay out now the acceleration of point D. You can pick any of the other points you want. I hope for obvious reasons, since everything has been so obvious to you guys going along here so far today, that uh, point A would be the easier one to pick. But you can use either B or C. Why would A be easier? No, it's not that. It's remember all these cross products. Uh, A is just a much simpler vector than any of the other vectors. Remember, you need the position vectors for these, and the position vector of D relative to A is much simpler than B to D or C to D. Not much simpler, but simpler. So, why give yourself a headache? when you're not getting me extra credit from me for giving yourself headaches. That's my job. So, you don't have to use point A if you don't want to. We know the acceleration vector of the other ones. You can use point uh, B or C. We know both of those now. Just remember, if you don't use point A here, you can't use point A at those other two places. These letters have, these subscript letters have to always match. So figure out the acceleration of point D. Nobody will find it remarkable because you're all clairvoyant, evidently. Did you know I was going to say that? No. Aha, uh -huh, you're not that clairvoyant then. get into your heads a little bit, I guess. Alright, so figure out what the acceleration is. We already have the acceleration of point A. It's the simplest of the acceleration vectors we've got. Uh, well, C would be pretty simple, but then the position vectors are a little more difficult. Figure out those those two components. Uh, if we get the same thing, we'll just keep moving. If we don't, is that it? I believe so. Oh, we'll see. Is that what your crystal ball told you? No, I just figured something. I'm not going to say what it is, so I don't get it right. But maybe you don't.
we'll see. Did you agree with her? Instead of B, we have a D here now. And then the normal component is easy enough done that way. For the for the normal component? This one's confusing. Uh, D, D, D relative to A, the vector that places D relative to A will be that one. That's R, B, so the opposite to A. Yeah, we want the opposite of that, which makes sense. Remember, that's the centripetal component. And if we're doing it relative to point A, it should point to, rel to point A. And if, if you do this double cross product, you should get the same thing. I don't want to do that. Because <laughs> you don't have two right hands, I understand. No, you, you have to figure out the direction of this vector first. Uh, let's see. Omega is into the board, crossed with D relative to A. So that's uh, plus J. And then Omega, again, is into the board, crossed with plus J, is in that direction. D headed right towards A. By the spectrum, that would have to be there. Yeah. Yeah. But, that is an easier way to do it for, for these kind of problems, and these are the kind of problems we're doing. So, Phil, did you get it? Yeah. You mean you're going to start now? Did you guys agree? Yeah. After, some decision. After some indecision? Some I mean, oh, discussion? You were wrong? Yes, my lady, you are the correct, and you should have changed yours. That would have been the gentleman thing to do. It. Yeah. <laughs> you okay? You getting it, Tom? Get on your head. What, Chris? You got it? No. Phil boycotting. I'm not thinking about it. Uh oh, Andrew's making that face. All right. Let's see. Uh, Acceleration of point A, we already know that's 3i. Then I think the, the, uh, the, the normal component has a direction and has a component in the i direction. Well, let's, let's write them down and see what you got. Uh, the, the tangential component, I got 3j. This is 3.0 meters per second squared j. And the normal component, 9.6i. So we can add that to the i component we've already got there. So this is 3 plus 9.6 in the i direction. That's the first and the third parts. And then the uh, Second part is the 3 uh, j, and that's all meters per second squared. So we get 12.6 i plus 3 j meters per second squared. And let's see, so point D is right here. It's got a strong component horizontally, even more than the uh, acceleration of the wheel itself. So that component is 12.6 meters per second, and a little one, one fourth of that component in the J direction, 3J.
So that's the acceleration of point B. Uh, it's accelerating in the horizontal direction with the whole wheel. It's got a centripetal component about point A anyway, and then it's headed on its way up the wheel as the wheel rotates, so that's the vertical component that we see there. Because a split second later, when the wheels moved a little bit farther, point B, point D will have moved up that wheel a little bit, so that's the vertical component. It's headed in that direction. Anybody need to see the steps it took to get any one of these? These two pieces here? Do the tangential one? Yeah. Do the tangential one yeah, the 3J? Yeah, just getting the... Okay. So that's A, D relative to A, uh, the acceleration of D relative to A in the tangential direction. That's the magnitude of these parts, both of which we have. Uh, D, remember not B here, this was set up for B. D is 150 millimeters away from point A. That's the R part. And then alpha is just the angular speed uh, of the wheel. What was that? Negative 20, yeah. Okay, but we only need the magnitude. 20 radians per second squared. And now we'll figure out the direction by doing alpha cross R D relative to A. Alpha, if you remember, is into the board because it's A, it's angular ro ro angular acceleration is clockwise. So that's uh, uh, A, I'm uh, sorry, alpha is into the board. Crossed with the vector that goes from A to D is plus J. So it's because you're pointing your fingers to the right or to the left? I put my fingers in the direction, the direction of right. alpha first. The only way I can get to the direction for this vector is if my thumb's pointing out. Right. Okay. My palm has to face D. That puts my thumb up, positive J direction, and that's just what we have here then. So uh, a bit easier way to do the cross product. Um, because all of our vectors are normal. If, if we had, if you'd done this relative to point C, you would have had uh, a different vector than those. It wouldn't have been quite as easy as this is. Joe? How's alpha into the board again? Because it's like going in circle on the board. Uh, no, that's, that's the, the way we draw it, but if we put our fingers in that direction, thumb has to be into the board. I can't curl my fingers in that direction and get my thumb to point anywhere else. Not on my right hand. I mean, I thought you had to cross A with something to get a direction or something. But A, you're saying A, the force of A is going to the board, but A itself is spinning in a different no. direction. No. There's A and there's alpha. Okay. Which one are you talking about? Alpha. Alpha. Alpha, the, the wheel is, rot is accelerating in a clockwise direction. And the only way I can curl my fingers in a clockwise direction is if my thumb is in the board. <coughs> so the vector, so alpha as a vector is, what was it, 20? 20 radians per second? Squared is in the minus k direction. And that's the right-hand rule. There's two ways we can draw rotation. We can do it with these curvy little arrows, but that's not a vector, because vectors do not curve. Vectors are straight. That's just a, a, a photographic representation of the acceleration. If we want the vector, we have to use our right-hand rule, and that puts uh, the angular acceleration vector into the board, which is nice makes it automatically perpendicular to all the other vectors we've got in the problem. Okay. Questions on that before we clean up and do a new problem? You'll like this. It's a beam problem. We've got a beam. 
but we don't have to go shopping for the beam because we already did that in the previous class. We've got 3,000 of them on the loading dock. We're just going to use one of them. All right, so here's the setup. I'll leave that because that's a fair reference. All right, so here's, here's one of those beams we just bought. Uh, at two points, not evenly spaced, this is three feet, that's four feet, this is three feet. <coughs> at two points, <coughs> evenly spaced, it's suspended from wires that run up to winches. So there's our beam. Uh, nice and level. Don't want to drop it. Maybe look at this maybe not as a beam, uh, but as one of those window washer platforms. And so you want these things nice and level so you don't lose uh, uh, window washing fluid. You can lose window washers, but they're replaceable. This, this day and age, you just put an ad in the paper, you got 60 people apply. So, so we want to keep it up over fluid. So here's the deal. So this is now being lowered at a steady rate, but then the brakes are put on the winches to slow the rate at which it's lowering. However, the winches don't have the same braking power, so one brakes better than the other. So I'll label this one B and C. We're going to take a look at the two endpoints, 2 A and D. So the acceleration, uh, as, as it's dropping, but uh, we put on the brakes of the winches, that causes an upward acceleration because those points are slowing down. And B is a little bit greater than the acceleration of D. So I'll drop that one. So there's, there's the acceleration of point B. There's the acceleration, no, not point B, point C. And the magnitude, five feet per second squared. And this is three feet per second squared. So we we're lowering it at constant velocity. Needed to stop lowering it, put on the brakes. That's the same as an upward acceleration of those two points. But due to an imbalance in the winches, the acceleration wasn't quite the same. So that causes uh, an angular acceleration of the beam in that direction. It's going to tilt such that A is higher than D uh, an instant later. So we want to find out some of those uh, some of those things. So we need to find that angular acceleration, but then also find the acceleration of points uh, A and D. We know the acceleration of points B and C. I want to find out the acceleration of points <coughs> A and B. How did you decide which way to draw out? Okay. By looking at the acceleration and what it would cause that to do, uh, because of the greater acceleration of point B than point C, a second later, the beam's going to be like that which means it's rotating in that direction. It wasn't before, it was lowering at steady rate, so it had no angular acceleration. Now, point B is being slowed down at a greater rate than is point C, so it's going to tilt then in this direction. And so it must be accelerated, have an angular acceleration in that direction. Two different ones, or just one? What do you mean two different ones? It only has, it's a rigid body, it only has one angular acceleration. 
A uh, split second later, that angular acceleration may be different because it not only has to do with the magnitude of these, but how far apart those are. And as it starts to tilt, those aren't the same distance apart as they are at this instant. But pretty soon it'll come to a stop and, and the window washers are gone. And we're on the news. All right, so see what uh, see what you can do with it. You need to find alpha in one way. Once we have alpha, then we can use it for any of the parts because alpha shows up here. Um, might need an omega squared. you can do it. <coughs> it should come up with the same answer either way. But uh, need to are real, uh, relate it to the acceleration of uh, one or the other of those because that's known. you can do this, this first part, find an alpha, and then once you find an alpha, we can do the other points because uh, we'll need those for, for those particular points. So, got it already? Let's see. relative to be in the tangential direction that could give us alpha because we know the uh, distance between them. The acceleration of d relative to b in the normal direction we could find, uh, well, we know the distance between them. We need the angular acceleration, sorry, the angular velocity of the beam. Which we don't have. So is this going to work? It is. Is zero? Remember when we did free fall, we drop an object, as soon as we let go of it, it has instantly has acceleration, but it has no velocity yet because it hasn't had any time. That acceleration is there, but it hasn't had any time to work. That's the same thing here, only rotationally. It has this rotational acceleration, but it hasn't had any time to work yet. It's still level. It was level just before, so this is actually zero because omega is zero at that instant. So, since that depends upon omega, and omega is zero. So we can then set that up. You could have done it for other points, because that would have happened with any of the points. I just picked B and D. Because we need an acceleration point D sometime anyway. 
So no sense doing this between point B and C. You can find alpha, but then you still have to back out and find D anyway. Were you thinking that? clairvoyant voice told you that, that was the case? No. Did you want to find Alpha first? No, this is how you're going to find Alpha. Because Alpha's in here. You know this. And you know, uh, you know point D. Um, oh, wait. I've got different letters in here. Let me read and see what I'm reading. Point, point D. Uh oh, hang on, hang on, hang on. <coughs> I, which is easier to change the letters here or change the letters there? Over there. Over there. Okay. So this is, because I wrote A, B, D, and E. I don't know where point C went on this, my notes here. So, uh, so this is C. Yeah, we're doing point C relative to B. So that makes more sense. Doesn't materially materially change anything. It just makes more sense, I guess, now. Because we know the acceleration of C. We know those two accelerations, uh, D and C. That makes more sense. Now we can find alpha. We know these two. We can find this as a function of alpha. And that's the only thing then we don't have. So remember, these are vectors. So this is 3 feet per second squared j. B is 5 feet per second squared j. Remember, the, the uh, beam was moving downward. Now they put on the brakes, so that's a equivalent to an acceleration upward. And then the tangential relative acceleration, we can do this way, and you can do the cross product with your right hand and see where it, uh, where it acts. And that will give us a chance to find alpha. So this is alpha times the distance between the two points, which is uh, B and C, which is 4 feet. And then the direction, alpha cross uh, C to B, uh, C relative to B. So that's... That vector. So alpha's into the board. Put your fingers in that direction into the board. You've got to face your palm towards point B, and that forces your thumb down. So that's minus J. So we have a uh, plus J, we, everything's in the J direction, so it all adds up together really well. And we can find that alpha. In fact, uh, we can cancel the J vectors. So 3 equals 5 minus 4 alpha is our equation. Because everything was in the same direction, so even the unit vectors would cancel. As well as all the units. Would you bet minus J? Got it from doing this. Alpha, alpha with that kind of rotation, angular acceleration is into the board. So alpha is into the board. We do alpha cross, okay. not B to A, but C to B. So that's alpha cross C to B, that's minus J. And so alpha then equals 0.5. Yep. Actually, the units don't all cancel because we only have feet there and feet per second squared there. So the feet cancel, we get 1 over 
over second squared there, one over second squared there, and then that'll become radians per second squared. So the ends do work out. You just have to be careful with them as usual. Okay, now we know alpha. Now you can find the acceleration of A and B. And you got six minutes to do it. You can do it. David's already done it. Because David knew I was going to ask that. He did it yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> That's the way to do school. David, isn't it? Just work a couple weeks ahead and then stop coming. You know what I'm going to put on the final exam. Just write it out and give it to me. You're all done. It's easy being clairvoyant. All right, so now we can find the acceleration of the other points. Let's see. We'll do one of them. I'll give it to you as a get out of class question. Actually, when you do one of them, you can uh, actually, yeah, I'll let you do one of them, and then I'll show you an even easier way to do it. But David already knows what I'm talking about. So, okay. they do them, but huh? I don't know what you're talking about by an easier way to do it. Well, it's graphical in nature. So you don't draw pictures. You, you think, I think you, you either think in pictures in your head or you think in words, but you don't draw down, write down pictures very often. So acceleration of B could be or acceleration of C, it's just as long as it's one we know. And then the usual two components. usual two components we have to pick up there. Oh, you're frowning. No. All right, we already know the acceleration of B. Plus 5J. Uh, it's in the same order. A, B, A, B. So the vectors won't be the A. Uh, which vector? Oh, this vector? Yes. Yeah, we've, we've switched the order of the letters here. So we have to switch the order of the letters everywhere else to get the right vector. What about this component? Yeah. Zero. Zero. So Anthony was smart. He did the easy one first. Now you can just take the rest of the day off, let everybody else do the hard one. Let's see, acceleration of B we've got. We just need to do that last little bit here. And so it's R, A, B. Well, it makes sense. Let's go. Alpha. Let's see, alpha is into the board. The position of A relative to B, that's that vector. Alpha in. So that's up. So that's uh, plus J. B is also plus J, so this is going to be even greater plus J. So what's R alpha for that one? Uh, 1.5? Yeah, so 6.5. Yeah, so this is 1.5 feet per second squared J. And so the acceleration of A is B, which is 5, plus another 1.5 more uh, is 6.5 feet per second squared J. Now, 
two minutes left. What's the easy way? Well, without doing this, could you find the acceleration of point D without doing the cross products and stuff? Can you do it by looking at the picture now that you've got three of the vectors? In fact, we could have done it with two of the vectors. Plus the three. So we've got these two points. We know their accelerations. That one's five. This one's three. This one's, we now know to be 6.5. not going to work unless you do a scale drawing, which this isn't quite. Phil, you see it? You're nodding. Chris, you see it? Tommy? Samantha? If we draw a straight line through these points, that will give us the acceleration of that other point. You'll have to draw it to scale. A sketch won't work. Well, you could draw it to scale and then do similar triangles and get it. But you get a little tiny bit left over here. I believe it's 0.5 feet per second squared. And you can prove that just by finding the acceleration of that point. Let me think. Oh, it's 1.5. Sorry. One. And that takes us into the weekend. It's time to relax. Oh, that's one thing stands out. Oh, that's an ant. Yeah, yeah, that's what it was. All right, any questions? Takes a little practice. Be methodical about this because if you do it too quickly, you're going to lose a minus sign. You're going to get a J direction and an I direction, and you're going to get a square. So be patient with these. Joe? Yeah, the, the negative, remember, was with the direction on the K vector. We only need, when we do this, we only need the magnitude. We've already got the direction as opposite to that. So you don't want to do, well, here you square it, so it doesn't matter as much. But here, the tangential direction is already defined. The minus 20 was part of that. <coughs> this is pure magnitude. These numbers. 